G'day. This video is about a treatment for men who already have prostate cancer. It is about adding an occasional testosterone boost to regular hormone therapy to treat prostate cancer. Dr. Sam Denmead of Johns Hopkins Medicine reports on encouraging trials of this approach. The small numbers in these trials mean your doctor will not be recommending this as part of a standard treatment as yet, except possibly in a clinical trial. When this video was made in February 2017, clinical trial openings were limited to the USA. But if you wish to understand a treatment which could become a game changer in future, this is for you. This video is an extract from an Answer Cancer Foundation online support group meeting. The full session started with an introduction to the Foundation by its leader, Rick Davis, and an introduction to Dr. Denmead by member Professor Bill Burham, a prostate cancer researcher. There will be a link to a full session at the end of this video, which also includes a full hour of questions and answers. Thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I don't have a webcam. Uh, I'm not much to look at anyway, but uh, so staring at me for an hour is probably not the best thing. And Hopkins doesn't pay us enough to have webcams, so I don't have one. No, I, I, I certainly wish I could be in there with you. So uh, I'm going to talk, uh, many of you are familiar with this, many of you aren't, about uh, what we have called bipolar androgen therapy. It has nothing to do with bipolar disorder, uh, although now I get a lot of emails from psychiatric meetings and things about my expertise in bipolar disorder. So uh, it's a name we came up with, and I'll sort of explain what it means in a moment. Um, just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, since everybody has different backgrounds, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on some background about androgens and androgen signaling. Some, a lot of you may know a lot about this already, so you can have a cup of coffee or tune out for a while. Kind of some rationale why we're doing this, and then some results from a, a pilot study, and then the study we're doing called the Restore study, uh, a little bit of information about the larger study we're doing called Transformer, and some thoughts about future directions in men with uh, using this approach in men who have castrate-resistant disease. And then I, I added a few slides at the end about a trial we did um, where we tried this as kind of a first-line therapy, in intermittent hormone therapy, and we just published a paper about that uh, uh, last year. So. I guess what we're not talking about today are, are the other things we use testosterone for. So testosterone replacement, as you're all aware, is a big business and a lot of debate and controversy about who should do it, who should not. Tons of stuff out there. Um, we're not talking about that today. Um, we're also not talking about testosterone that's used in another way, which is as a steroid. Uh, although I've gotten a lot of interest from various groups about this as well. Um, and it is amazing what you can buy on the internet if, if you want. So we're not talking about that either. What we're going to be talking about is using testosterone, high-dose testosterone, as treatment for prostate cancer, um, and uh, the, the bipolar story um, is, is what we're going to get to. So first, just some simple stuff. What is an androgen? I think everyone needs to understand that when I say testosterone, I'm referring to a family of, com of chemicals. Um, so testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, all these things are something called steroid hormones, which bind to a thing inside cancer cells called the androgen receptor. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Androgens are very important primarily um, for sexual differentiation. So as the fetus is developing, if there's no androgens and you have an XY, a male, you end up with a female. So the default shape of a human is a female unless you have a little testosterone in there. Uh, testosterone is also important for the primary sex characteristics, so making sperm and making all and, and, and sort of um, maintaining the sex tissues like the prostate, the penis. And then finally, testosterone is very important uh, in a lot of other things, bone density, muscle, libido, hair growth, you know, hematopoiesis, which is making red blood cells, um, in the brain. There's lots of important things. Uh, we certainly have learned a lot about how important testosterone is with our therapies that take it away. So all the side effects we get from hormone deprivation are related to the importance of testosterone, not just in the prostate, but in the whole body. So what is a steroid hormone? Uh, these are some chemical structures. I don't expect you to, to understand what they are. 
basically carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. But you can see that this shape is a very important shape in nature. So all of these steroid hormones look the same. They have the same shape with different things hanging off the side. Um, and they're interchangeable. Testosterone can be made into estrogen. It can be made into dihydrotestosterone. Progesterone is a precursor for all these different compounds. Um, so again, when I talk about steroid hormones, this is what we mean, the shape of molecules. And then how do we make these things? And so this is a very complicated uh, uh, um, thing in the body that involves lots of different uh, tissues and organs. So it starts in the brain. A part of the brain called the hypothalamus makes something called LHRH, which is a hormone that moves from the hypothalamus part of the brain to a gland called the pituitary gland that sits right under the hypothalamus. It makes another hormone that gets in the blood and goes to the testicle, and there the testicle makes testosterone out of, starting with cholesterol, a bunch of, ke of chemical steps uh, to get to testosterone. We know that other things can make testosterone, the adrenal gland, uh, the muscle makes some testosterone, and this testosterone gets into the blood and goes all over the body and affects lots of tissues. In the prostate, relatively specifically in the prostate, there's an enzyme that converts testosterone into something called dihydrotestosterone, which is a more potent form of testosterone. Uh, it binds better. It's a stronger form. And then once it's in the prostate, uh, bound up as it is, uh, it then does all the different things that testosterone does in the prostate to stimulate things like growth, make more PSA, make fluid for the, for the um, uh, um, semen, etc. So I use this analogy to talk about this story with my patients a lot, and so I thought I'd make a slide out of it. So I, I talk about the androgen receptor, and I think of the androgen receptor like a baseball glove and the androgen like a ball. And for this to be active, the ball has to be inside the glove um, to form an active complex. And as you'll see later, most of our therapies really are about trying to disrupt the ball getting into the glove. So in a more complicated way, um, the androgen receptor is a protein, and it has a couple different parts. It has a, a part that's a signaling part uh, that other proteins stick onto. It has a part that's called the DNA binding part, so this receptor has to stick on the DNA to do things. And it has a part that androgen binds to. And you can see there to the right on the slide, without androgen, the androgen receptor is in a certain shape. And then when androgen, in this case DHT, this, this sort of reddish-purple diamond is available, the receptor binds to it, changes its shape, moves into the cell nucleus, sticks on the DNA, and then does and activates all the genes that either prostate or prostate cancer uh, use to grow, to survive, and then to make things like PSA, acid phosphatase, other growth factors. Um, so the goal of all the therapy is really to disrupt this process, um, at least the standard therapies that we have. So turning to the prostate itself, um, I'm sure all of you know where your prostate gland is, but I, I once had a student who did not at one of his exams, which was shocking to me. So I always try to include a picture to show where the prostate is. Uh, so it sits right underneath the bladder. And as you know, the urine flows through the urethra, from the bladder, through the prostate, through the penis, but also through the prostate comes um, the semen, and the prostate's responsible for making a lot of the fluid of the semen. But we still don't really exactly know what the prostate does um, in terms of uh, its primary function. We know it's involved in fertility in some way, but you could take out a the semen or the sperm from a man and still fertilize an egg. So the prostate isn't critical for that. But it causes a lot of problems, even though we don't know what it does. And it's really small, but it's really one of the major problems of a man as he ages. First, most men get what's called BPH. Uh, almost all of us will get this by the, by the age of 80. Um, and that gives us lots of issues with urinary problems. We also know that a lot of men walk around with prostate cancer. It's thought that up, up to 40% of men by the time they're 40 have some 
microscopic prostate cancer. Unfortunately, in most men, that doesn't progress to become clinically significant, uh, but certainly there's a lot going on there uh, that we don't understand. And there's about 220,000 cases a year now. Uh, the, the number of cases has been declining, as has the death rate, thankfully, uh, but still a good number of men, unfortunately, die every year uh, from prostate cancer. So the original therapy and thinking about prostate cancer that had really uh, started was way, way back in the 1940s. And the hero of this story is really this guy, Dr. Charles Huggins. Um, and he was at the University of Chicago, and he was even there when I was a resident there, although he was about 85 then, and uh, no one really knew who he was by that point. But he was a brilliant guy, and you can see the date on this study is 1941. And he was the first guy to show that you could treat advanced prostate cancer by lowering testosterone. And he wrote these two papers in 1941, which really changed really how we treat prostate cancer. And at the time, really almost a miracle uh, for a lot of men who had very advanced cancer. Uh, we didn't have PSA at that point. Um, and so he made a huge impact and he won the Nobel Prize uh, for this story um, uh, later in the 60s. And he was able to show that in 1940 that you could use a biomarker to you know, really look to see if a treatment was actually working. And that kind of anticipated a lot of what we're doing today. So getting back to this glove and ball, um, most of our, or all of our hormone therapies right now, as I said, this is how they work. They try to disrupt the ball getting into the glove. So one way you could do that is just get rid of testosterone. So you can cut off the testicle. You can give Lupron to shut off the testicle. You can give drugs like Zytiga, Abiraterone, which turns off the enzyme that makes uh, testosterone. Um, and so you end up with an empty ball. Or you can give things that block testosterone getting into the glove or into the receptor, things like Casadex and Xtandi. And these are things that kind of are shaped like testosterone, but when they get into the glove, the glove doesn't work quite right because testosterone can't get in there. It's close to the shape, but not quite, quite the shape. And we're very good at this, making drugs to block testosterone. These are all the drugs that we have since the 1940s. You can see in the 40s, most of what we focused on was surgery. So we cut off the testicle, we cut out the adrenal gland, we even cut out the pituitary gland. And then later we started to have all these different drugs, which really all of them do the same thing in, in some way or another, is blocking that interaction. And we've now, in 2016, reached this point Many of you on the call are probably on some part of this, and the arrows kind of go all over the place, so uh, the flow of this is um, variable. But for the most part, most men receive primary hormone therapy. We're using more chemotherapy now with primary hormone therapy. Everybody reaches this, unfortunately, this castrate-resistant phase, and then we do lots of things. We try more hormone therapy. We have non-hormonal therapies. There's a lot of clinical trial interest right now in lots of things. Some big themes are immunotherapy, PARP inhibitors, uh, some interest in PSMA targeting, things like that. But, but this is the current, current paradigm. So turning backwards to Dr. Huggins again, kind of back to the future. Dr. Huggins, I, you know, this is an idea I'm working on, but he's a guy that proposed it 50 years ago and really thought of two different ways you could do this. One is to deprive the hormones, and we've seen 75 years of that. But then the other way he proposed was you give a lot of hormones um, to interfere with the hormone receptor. Unfortunately, no one really listened to that part of the story, um, and so we haven't seen a lot of research in that area. Dr. Huggins went on to do this approach, even though he was a urologist, he went on to do this in breast cancer with estrogen, uh, not really focused on prostate cancer uh, at that point in his career. So this is one of the credos I've lived by about this idea, which is by Albert Einstein, for an idea that does not first seem insane, there is no hope. And so at first, when you think about this idea, many of you out there, your doctors have worked with you and you've been almost Pavlovian kind of reflex that you can't have any testosterone, it's the devil. Um, and so when we first proposed this idea, we, most of the people thought we were pretty crazy, and, and we probably were. Um, 
and so maybe that's why it works. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that road, but but um, I, I have this over my desk at work, so I thought I'd share it with you. So why would this work, and why do this? And so I've been using this slide in a lot of the presentations I do, um, and it's a slide that has really nothing to do with prostate cancer. It's about shrimp. And so these are shrimp that live in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. They're called brine shrimp. It used to be, you all probably remember in every comic book, there used to be an uh, ad for sea monkeys that you would buy dried and you throw them and you get, you get these animals. This is what they were. Um, and these are harvested and they're used for, as fish feed a lot um, around, the, you know, in aquariums. But these are incredible animals. So they can live in incredible conditions in salt water that's 10 times more salty than the sea. They live in crazy temperature ranges, but if the snow melts too fast in the mountains, this is in Utah, and it floods the lake, all of them die. So they basically get killed by water, uh, even though they can tolerate all kinds of different conditions. It's because they can't adapt to the change. Um, they die by sort of shock. So I kind of think about hormone therapy like that. It's kind of a shock. So the cancer is living in this nice testosterone stable environment and then we give a therapy that takes the testosterone to zero and that's an incredible shock it's the major growth factor for the cancer and it's gone and so we know that very rapidly people respond and so most of the response we see in patients is within the first few months PSA plummets tumors shrink pain gets better and so we go through this shock phase and then we reach a phase that's PSA is undetectable maybe or low, that phase can last months to many years, and the tumor is still there, it kind of goes dormant. We don't really know exactly what's happening at this stage. It's hard to study because there's not much to biopsy, there's not much to do, but we know the cancer is there, kind of, sort of, in my mind, sort of rolling the dice, trying to figure out how can I grow again in this low testosterone environment. Eventually it figures it out. Um, and it becomes, and we call that resistance, it starts to grow again in this new environment we placed it in. It, it adapts to it. So this, my analogy is there's sort of a sweet spot where the cancer likes to live, and when we perturb it, it doesn't necessarily die. It can take a little bit of change, but not a lot. So when we give it antiandrogens, blocked androgens, we shock it, and we drop the growth, but it suggests this, this model that we could go the other way and give it a lot of androgens and shock it too. We could basically move it out of its comfort zone. And for that reason, these kind of results, this is what got me started, these kind of weird results. These are, this is cells in a dish, and you can see that they grow fine, but if you give them an androgen called R1881, they stop growing. And if you give an anti-androgen, Cassidex, they stop growing. So they respond to shocking them in either direction. And that was always intriguing to me, why that could be. One of the reasons we think these cells get resistant, and one of the main reasons is they still want that androgen receptor. They're still kind of addicted to it. And they just titrate. They make more and more and more of it until they get a new level that, is, that works for them. And so what we see in the cancer is, the cancer cells start to make a ton more of this receptor, maybe a hundred times more than, it, than they started with. And they make more copies of the gene, and they mutate the thing, and they make variants of the thing that don't need the ball anymore. Uh, but, but it still seems like it's a critical thing. So uh, there's a lot of evidence in the lab, and a lot of it was led by this guy who was a colleague of Dr. Huggins, who showed early on that if you took cells that had been adapted to live in low testosterone and you suddenly gave them high testosterone, they would stop growing. This is a graph of an, in an animal showing that you go from point number two to point number three. Now over time the cancer readapts, starts to grow again, and they showed later that you could then drop the testosterone and, they, and the tumors would shrink again. And the other part of this picture shows at the beginning, the little dark lines here, you can see it's, the androgen receptor is sort of light gray. When they've been adapted, the line gets darker, suggesting there's more androgen receptor. And then when they get exposed to testosterone for a while, they readapt and kind of go back to baseline again. So 
they're able to change depending on the, on the environment. So we found in our lab and others, you know, this seems to work. You know, the cancer cells stop growing when you give them what we thought was their growth factor. So it's kind of a paradox. It's hard to understand, really. And why this exactly happens, we don't really know. There's lots of different reasons that we, we that in the lab people have shown, and this is maybe more detail than you need, but just the point here is that it does a lot of things. We're not sure which one of these is the critical thing or if all of these things are the critical thing, but certainly giving high dose testosterone has a profound effect on the cell. Some cells don't care, some cells grow a little better, and then some cells, about a third of the prostate cells in, in the lab, stop growing when we give when we give testosterone. We also know that the dose is important. So when you give a little bit, either nothing happens or they grow a little better. And then when you give a lot, they're blocked. And we see this if you look at them. So these panels, B is what these cells look like under the microscope. D is what they look like with a little bit of testosterone. It still look healthy. And F is, you can see lots of little dots, and big clumps. The cells are starting to fall apart uh, under the high dose. So it became evident to us that we were going to do a trial that we probably needed to use not regular levels, the kind you can get with things like hormonal replacement gels, but, but some kind of shock level. And I'll show you how we achieved that in a second. So our, our hypotheses were, one, that maybe we could take men who are castrate resistant and give them a shock of testosterone, high dose, and then drop the level real fast. So kind of a high shock followed by a low shock. This wouldn't let the cancer cells adapt to the environment very easily, and we might be able to uh, catch them um, out of phase, so to speak. We, we thought we could disrupt the regulation of the receptor, and we also thought that we might also be able to resensitize because if these cells adapted and dropped the receptor, they might become sensitive again to things that lower hormone therapy, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So this is what I mean by what we call bipolar androgen therapy. We're basically taking men and giving them an injection of testosterone in the buttock, in the muscle. This dose of 400 milligrams, it's an FDA-approved dose. So even though it's high dose, it's not crazy high dose. So it's an it's approved dose that used to be given to men to kind of restore testosterone in older men who had low, their testosterone got low. There's lots of other ways to do that now. Um, with gels and creams and things you put under your tongue and all kinds of things. But we're using an FDA-approved uh, drug, testosterone cypionate, and we call it bipolar to reflect that we're, we're moving quickly from really low to really high, so these two sort of polar extremes. Um, the testosterone here, when we injected, uh, we had a, our level here was 1,500. The lab stopped measuring it, but we know from other studies we probably get two to 3,000. A level in a man who's about 70 years old is probably two to three hundred, and then a castrate level is really zero. So this is a big change uh, in the level uh, that happens really fast. And so we started with a, a pilot study. This, this was funded by a, I had a patient of mine uh, who had prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, and amazingly, while he was suffering from it, he started this small foundation and raised money, had golf tournaments, did all kinds of things, and it helped support my lab, and then later he supported this small study with some seed funding. And initially we did a combination of testosterone and a toposide. Toposide is a chemotherapy that blocks DNA repair. And there was some evidence when we started that maybe that's how this works, that testosterone can cause breaks in the DNA, and if you block repair, the two could work well together. What we found was a lot of the men kept responding. We did this for three cycles, and if they responded, we kept them on it just testosterone alone, and they kept responding. So we weren't sure the etoposide was helping, and we certainly saw that it was making men sick. It made them lose their hair, a lot of nausea, fatigue, anemia. Sadly, we had one man die um, on the study from, uh, from sepsis, from his blood counts getting too low. So, uh, but we were really encouraged, and I might even say shocked, to see this kind of response. And so some of the men... When we first gave the testosterone, their PSA would jump up right away, um, and then, um, to our surprise, start to drop. And you can see this patient here, uh, this is an example, ends up getting this treatment for 18 cycles. Uh, this is an example of what his big lymph node in his pelvis did. 
kind of shrunk quite a bit. And then we also saw when we stopped the testosterone, we had even a further response once the man was castrated again. So we, were, we, we saw this in a good number of the patients, and uh, it was quite exciting to us. Overall, about 30% of the guys had uh, what we, in our business, count as a response, which is PSA went down by 50%. About half of the men had some shrinkage by 50% of, of their tumors. This was mostly in lymph nodes. Uh, we, the, the bone changes were a little bit harder for us to see. Most of the men had stable bone disease, uh, not worsening disease. It was pretty safe. Really nobody, nobody started with pain and nobody developed pain. And I'll talk about pain a little bit later. Um, and some of the men stayed on a long time. In fact, one man was on it for three years. Um, and uh, the, the men felt really good. A lot of the men who had lost their, their uh, ability to have uh, sexual function were extremely happy when it came back. Um, and a lot of the men didn't want to stop the therapy even though their PSA was going up because they felt so good. And to our surprise, all of the men that we put back on some kind of hormone lowering drug, it worked again. And a couple of the guys, even a drug that hadn't been working, that they were failing, we put them back on the same drug and it worked. Um, and so. All of that was really uh, interesting, and it allowed me to, to have this weird um, experience where I, I live off of grants here at Johns Hopkins, and I, I often will send the same grant into more than one place because the chances of getting the grant is very low. And with this approach, I had the weird experience of getting two grants at the same time, which has never happened to me before. And so that is, that's allowed us now to do two different studies. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about those two studies uh, along the way here. So the first study, um, I really like acronyms. So you can see this is one of my first acronyms, uh, which we call the RESTORE study. And this study is um, taking men who have progressed on either abiraterone or enzalutamide or both, and then giving them this treatment with testosterone alone, and then seeing what happens. So 30 men on the study will get either enzalutamide or abiraterone enzalutamide, but whatever they got last, if it's enzalutamide, they would get re-exposed to that. The same is true for abiraterone. Um, they all stayed on continuous block of their, of their own testosterone production with Lupron or things like Lupron, because we wanted to be able to control the testosterone. And so we've now able to now finish the part of the study where the men who were on enzalutamide, uh, were still recruiting uh, for the abiraterone arm. So I was going to show you some of the data we have on this study. So some of the eligibility, they had to stay on hormones. They had to have a rising PSA. They had to have some kind of disease we could measure. Uh, and then we didn't allow anybody who had anything worrisome, like spinal cord issues, problems with urinary tract. And then... Um, the big one was pain. So in the past, people have tried to use this approach to treat bone pain by combining it with things like radioactive compounds. And what they found, this was back in the 70s, is that when you gave a man with bone pain from prostate cancer testosterone, the bone pain got very worse very fast. Um, and so we have excluded on our studies anybody with symptoms. We've had a few men that we miss judged the symptoms thinking they had arthritis when it was pain from prostate cancer. And just like back in the 70s, we saw the pain get very bad, uh, often before they even got home from the clinic. Um, it's interesting why it happened so fast. We're not sure what's going on. It's definitely not making cancer cells grow. It's probably stimulating some kind of inflammation in the cancer. Most of those men, the pain goes away within about a week, and a bunch of the men we only had a handful, three or four, but I shouldn't say a bunch. In those men, it seemed like the pain didn't come back. But we've been really hesitant to, you know, induce bad pain if we can avoid it. So this is the PSA response we saw. So um, you don't have to care about the colors. This is something we call a waterfall plot. We use this a lot in oncology. So the bars below the line are the people that had a good response, and the bars above are the guys that didn't. Of course, again, we get excited if it's more than a 50% drop. So you can see about half of the guys had a drop in a PSA 
And just like the earlier studies, about a third had a big drop. Um, the other piece of this is one of our mechanisms I mentioned earlier was we thought uh, from some studies in, in our labs of our colleagues here that testosterone might be able to break the DNA. So many chemotherapies cause a single break in the DNA. Uh, most chemotherapies do not cause a double strand break. Often double strand breaks can be lethal because it's really hard for the cancer to glue that back together. So you can see here, uh, this is a, just an image of the, of the cancer cells treated with DHT. All those little pink dots are places where the DNA is broken. So you can see the control that didn't get any therapy has a few, and the ones that got DHT have a lot. So with that in mind, we were starting to explore why is this working in some of these guys. And I'm going to show you the um, response of one man. Uh, this is our best response. This is a man uh, who got a lot of different treatments, as you can see, a lot of hormone treatments. Um, he came on the study with a PSA of around 10. Um, we started the testosterone. He basically had a complete response. So all of his PSA went to zero, and all of his disease disappeared. He was on the study for about two years like that. Um, recently, unfortunately, we, first we thought we cured him because of this, but in the last month, his PSA has gone up to 0.2, so we probably didn't cure him. Um, but we had a really profound effect, and so we started thinking, if we could just figure out this one guy, maybe we can get on to something. So the first thing we did is some genetic testing on him, and to our surprise, uh, he had two mutations in very key DNA repair enzymes, BRCA2 and ATM. So we're now going back in our study and starting to look at you know, the other guys that responded is this a feature of that? And maybe that's a marker for who would respond to this. Um, so just an overview of where we are. These are the 30 or so, 29 guys on the this first part of the study. Again, I, as I mentioned, about a third of them had a good response. Um, when we looked at their x-rays, uh, about 15% had tumors that actually shrank. And the rest of them had, uh, for the most part, stable disease. A lot of it, that was in the bone. And then a few men uh, actually showed progression uh, of their disease. In terms of safety, it was really, uh, like the first study, pretty safe. Uh, the biggest side effects we see are some tenderness in the breast. Uh, some men get some swelling. Um, we had a few men have very some pain develop, but very low grade. Uh, not always easy to know if it's cancer pain or not, but uh, that was our score. Uh, a couple of guys had some bad things happen, and we don't know, again, if that's related to testosterone or, uh, you know, things like a, a heart attack. These are older guys, um, so they're at risk of heart attack anyway. Pulmonary embolism, again, could be due to testosterone, but also is a risk for uh, just from prostate cancer. So we haven't, we've only seen these in individual people, um, and so we're not totally clear how it's related. And then, of course, we saw very positive effects. Most of the men uh, feel a lot more energy. We certainly see their blood counts go way up. Um, and those men who could have uh, erections, get their erections back, uh, it certainly is a way to make your libido go through the roof. Um, and sometimes it's frustrating for men who can't have erections because they have libido, but they can't do anything. And one of my patients complained that he chases his wife around now, but when he catches her, he can't do anything. So uh, that's been, uh, uh, you know, a good thing and a bad thing, I guess, depending on, on how you look at it. And the other part of the study was looking at, well, what happens when we take the people off the testosterone? Can we resensitize them if we give them enzalutamide again? And so, or Xtandi. So here we found that most of the men, the uh, PSA goes back down when we give them Xtandi. Now, these are all men who had been on Xtandi and the PSA was going up when we started. So we were pleased to see that in a lot of the men, it goes back down. Uh, unfortunately, most of those men, that PSA response is short-lived. So it's somewhere between three to six months. Um, again, I like showing my extreme responders. We've had, we've had one or two patients have a response like this, though, where um, they have a dramatic decline uh, in their PSA. And again, this man also had mutations in this DNA repair although these are mutations that we're not sure what their significance is. They hadn't been described before. 
but it is intriguing that in both of these extreme responders, uh, we did see something um, related to, to DNA repair. So um, the other part of the study that we looked at is, uh, you, you, you all may be familiar with the story or not about the androgen receptor variant. Um, this is a, a kind of uh, thing that it's hard to conceptualize, but I'm going to do the best I can. So basically the way I explain this to patients is the cancer can start making a variant of the androgen receptor that basically is a glove that doesn't need a ball. So it can still signal in the nucleus of the cell without androgen. So here I just showed in a cartoon, you could see that same cartoon we used before, I've just cut off the part of the protein that testosterone sticks to. And so in studies done here at Johns Hopkins, we now have a test for this. And I think there will soon be a test that will become a standard test around the country. Um, but in this first study, we looked at guys who either didn't have or did have this variant. It's called variant 7. So you can see the blue bars. If you were variant 7 negative, you had about a 50% response to these drugs. But if you had the variant in your blood, variant positive, nobody responded to the drugs. We've done a follow-up study in a larger number to confirm that, although it looks like the response is very low, not zero, but low. The other thing we started to see was if you had that variant, your disease was probably a worse disease and probably grew and progressed faster. And we don't have enough evidence, uh, evidence yet, but it's looking like you might, patients like that might die faster. So we're starting to work, think about other treatments that we can do uh, in this group. Well, one of the interesting things about the androgen or the testosterone is we're looking at the men in our study who have the variant. And so uh, we had a cohort here of, of uh, six of them uh, out of a total of uh, um, 17 men uh, that we could sample. And so we had six men that were positive for this variant. And all six became negative when they got on the testosterone. And some of those men actually responded to the testosterone well so, also. So we're excited by that, and we got to sort of follow up what that means and whether by knocking down the variant you could add another drug here in combination um, is what we might want to explore. Unfortunately, when we put the men back on abiraterone or enzalutamide, the variant comes back on um, pretty quickly. So the machinery kind of stays there. Um, and we're still working the details out of how we might take advantage of this information. So the other thing is an ad. We're about to open a third arm of the Restore study. And this is an arm for men who are just newly castrate resistant. So their PSA has started to go up. They haven't had any other hormone treatment. We think this might be the best place to use this therapy with testosterone because the cancer cell has not adapted in other ways yet. Um, and so that arm is going to be 30 patients. It's going to be here at Johns Hopkins, and it will open probably next month. Uh, we're doing a lot of additional correlative things, and we're going to try to look at and do genomic testing on all the patients also to try to get more uh, information about whether this DNA repair goes along with responding to the treatment. So the other study we're doing um, which I don't have a lot of data to share with you. I will just tell you a little bit about it. It's called the TRANSFORMER trial. And TRANSFORMER is this crazy acronym that I made up um, that no one can remember, but that's okay. Uh, it, it killed an hour of time for me. Um, the grant that we got was from the Department of Defense Prostate Cancer Research Program, and it was called a transformative grant. So we decided to call the trial the TRANSFORMER trial. Um, and this was a very uh, good-sized grant, which is now allowing us to do a, a bigger trial to kind of prove uh, this concept. So this is a little bit different trial. And here, these are men who are have been on hormone therapy and have give, been given abiraterone and are progressing. They then get randomized to either receive enzalutamide as standard treatment or testosterone. And instead of PSA as the kind of endpoint we're looking at, we're actually looking at how long does it take their, their CAT scan, bone scan to get worse. And one of the reasons we did that is because, as you may be aware, PSA is a gene that's controlled by testosterone. So you could have the scenario when you give testosterone, even though the cancer doesn't get any worse, it can make more PSA. 
and it would fool you into how effective this could be. So those earlier studies, you know, those results we saw are great. They might even be better. We just don't know because we're looking at PSA as the endpoint. So this study is really a, a harder endpoint of how long till we see the scans get worse. Just like the previous study, the men have to stay on some type of hormone suppression, Lupron, Zolodex, whatever. And then when these men progress on their, on their scans, they get the opportunity to cross. So the testosterone men can go on enzalutamide, and the enzalutamide men can go on testosterone. And in this study, we're looking at a number of things, how the androgen variant uh, is, is affected, some scans that we're doing, a, a couple other correlative studies. We're trying to enroll 180 patients. We have 17 places in the U.S. that are doing the study. We've enrolled about 143 patients, although we only have about 120 that were eligible. So we're still looking for 60 or so patients, and uh, it's a three-year grant. So we're trying to we're in the third year, so we're trying to enroll all those patients this year, so we can at least complete the enrollment, and then we'll start following the patients for a response. So these are patients that have to be in pretty good shape. Uh, they can't have had other had enzalutamide before. And a lot of people have asked us why we did it this way. At the time we wrote the grant, enzalutamide wasn't approved yet, and so we had to pick some place to start. So I know a lot of men start with enzalutamide now and aren't eligible for this, and that's just, the, unfortunately, the way it rolled out. Um, I tend to use more abiraterone as my first new drug anyway, uh, based on how I see the patients tolerated, but each physician is different. Um, patients have to have metastatic disease, and then they have to have show some kind of progression on abiraterone. And again, the, the key things we're excluding is anybody with pain. Uh, we're excluding people who've gone on to uh, chemotherapy for resistant disease because we're, again, trying not to take patients who have, are too far down in the, in the, in the uh, disease kind of progression because uh, we're worried about the pain developing. Uh, we don't want anybody who has, we can't enroll people who have problems with their prostate blocking their urine because we, the testosterone can make the prostate get a little bit bigger. And then again, nobody who has risky disease that we're worried about breaking a bone or spinal cord or things like that. So these are the sites uh, all around the country. Um, these, these slides I think will be on your website, so you don't have to try to look at all of them. But it's a pretty good distribution. We have uh, sites in the Midwest. Uh, sites in the south, sites that on out in the west, uh, Colorado, California. One place where we don't have sites, uh, New York, Massachusetts, uh, these are, you know, where two of the big cancer centers are. Texas, we don't have a site. Um, uh, you know, they have their own things going on, so we don't, we don't have a uh, site there. Uh, one of the sites in Texas we closed because they weren't able to put anybody on the study. Um, we've had people travel from, you know, fair distance. Uh, so far, the farthest is Hawaii. Uh, to come to Baltimore uh, to be on the study. Um, and unfortunately, although we've got a lot of interest from around the planet, uh, we have not, uh, we don't have anything going on in anywhere else in the U.S. Uh, we have been in talks uh, with an investigator in Australia uh, who is very, who's a person we know very well, who's very interested in uh, opening some kind of study uh, in Australia, in Sydney, uh, I think it's in Sydney, um, and we're talking about what we might do that would be different, where we might learn something um, through some kind of combined study with, with uh, the group there. So there'll be more to tell about that later. Um, so again, we have uh, 16 sites enrolling. Uh, so far we've treated, uh, well, now as of today, 122 patients. Um, we've had a couple of safety meetings. Uh, right now we're blinded to the results. But we do have some safety meetings along the way to make sure we're not doing anything bad. And those safety meetings uh, have given us the go-ahead to, to keep going. Uh, when we get our first 70 guys who've had progression and, and need to cross, uh, we're going to look at the, the data. Um, if it looks really good, the study will end and we'll declare victory. And if it looks really bad, the study will end and we'll, we'll you know, fall on our swords and declare defeat. Um, but most likely what will happen is there won't be enough uh, events to, to make a definitive conclusion yet. I want to show you this is um, the first guy on the study, and I just this I only show this as potential to show you maybe the potential of this in my fantasies. So this is a patient who was on uh, two of my studies. 
The first one, he was on testosterone, I showed you earlier, for 18 cycles. We took him off testosterone. He had a nice response to being castrated again. Uh, started to progress, put him back on testosterone, and then at the, that time, a study became available of abiraterone, which we put him on. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't respond at all to abiraterone, had progression. And so we challenged him for the third time with testosterone, and he's had a third uh, response. And now we're going on our, our sixth year together uh, with basically treating him with on and off with testosterone, I guess. So, so it shows at least some potential. He's also the first man that we treated with a lot of liver metastases. And to my great amazement, um, he had a, a nice response with his liver uh, lesions disappearing um, on his first scan. So there's many questions to answer with this approach uh, in this castrate resistant population. And I guess the first question we're going to learn is, should we keep doing this? We're hoping we'll get a good sign from this big study we're doing to say yes to that. The second question we're faced with is, can we move, how do we move forward with this idea? Um, this is not a, this idea does not involve a drug company. Uh, testosterone is generic. Um, so it's really been based on getting some funds. So we're struggling with, with really how to go, what's the next step. Our thoughts are the next steps would be some kind of, you know, intelligent combination therapy. So if anybody's on the line and has a million dollars, they're not, uh, not needing and want to cut a check, we'd love to share it. Or if somebody on the line knows a million people who wants to give us a dollar, uh, we take that too. So we're trying to find ways through philanthropy, maybe other grant uh, mechanisms. It's difficult once you get a bunch of grants to try to go back to that well. The grant agencies often will say, well, this isn't, any, this isn't novel anymore. You know, what, what are you going to do for me lately? So it's a bit of a struggle, and we're still trying to think about how to do that. Um, some questions are, you know, how, what's the best way to do this? Should we give, is this shock high, low the best way? Would it be better to give this as some kind of new kind of cream or something where we can, you know, turn it off and on uh, right away? One of the problems with the shot is the testosterone goes very high, and then the drop is variable. Some men at the end of a month, their testosterone is very low. Some men, it's kind of low, um, and we don't really know what's the best way. We've been doing it once a month, mostly for convenience uh, for men who, you know, want to be on a kind of a, a routine cycle um, approach. We're looking at a lot of things we could combine with it. Uh, could we combine other things that block DNA repair uh, based on maybe a mechanism of DNA damage? Is there an effect of testosterone on the immune th system? We think there is. We're studying that. Uh, we just opened a study at Hopkins. This is really... Um, goes back to the Einstein quote about insanity. So we're doing a study where we're actually doing bone marrow transplant in men. Um, and our idea here is um, taking uh, men who are newly castrate resistant, um, who haven't had a lot of therapy, uh, probably young men. And these men uh, have to have a female donor. And we think by using a female who doesn't have a prostate, that donor's immune system will see the prostate as a foreign thing once it gets into the, the, to the new host. And we also um, have a new way to do bone marrow transplants where just about everybody has a donor now. Um, it doesn't have to be a perfect match. And as part of the bone marrow transplant, we're giving high-dose testosterone uh, at, at later on to try to stimulate the cancer cells. Um, these are men who are going to stay castrate. To try to stimulate the cancer cells to turn on all these new proteins that this new immune system might recognize. So. That just opened. We have our first man. We haven't treated him yet, um, but uh, hopefully we'll have some good results, and I can share that with you down the road. Um, so that's where we are, and I'm going to jump to one last thing, that we can take questions. And this is, uh, well, some points to take home. Uh, again, this looks safe. It does look like some men respond. It looks like we could resensitize. It, it's, it certainly seems to improve the quality of life in some men. So I think it's promising. It's still experimental. It's definitely not a cure. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to figure this out one way or another uh, where this fits uh, in the treatment. And then the last thing I wanted to share, just because I had some questions about this, a quick question that we addressed, which is, um, could we do this earlier? Could we give this as, 
as first-line therapy. So we did a study, and we published it recently in the journal The Prostate. And the question we asked was, what if we did intermittent hormone therapy a different way? Uh, instead of castrating and then stopping and waiting, waiting, waiting till that testosterone slowly recovered, if our goal was to recover the testosterone, why not just give it? And maybe we could prolong the sensitivity. Maybe we could make men feel better. Maybe we could minimize some of the side effects, some of the metabolic issues, and maybe we can improve quality of life. So I'm sure many of you on the phone are dealing with this, with the hormone therapy, all the problems of hormone therapy. Um, you learn how important testosterone is when you take it away. Um, and so these are things that intermittent hormone therapy uh, was designed to maybe try to make better. It's not clear how well we do there with that. Um, and so uh, if you look at this is how we usually do intermittent therapy, if anybody's on that approach. Um, you know, we give it for a while, then we stop it. Um, if you respond, we let you recover your testosterone, which sometimes takes a long time. When the PSA gets up to a certain level, we start it again. And if you respond, we just repeat uh, until you have resistance. And then if you don't respond, we just continue on regular hormone therapy and add others. So the advantage of this approach may be that we can improve your quality of life. In my opinion, the disadvantage is there's a variable recovery. It's a slow recovery. It gets back to this idea of adaptation. So we're giving the cancer lots of time to readapt to this slow recovery. So uh, the other piece to share with you is some prognostic information from one of these studies where it basically showed if you get your primary hormone therapy, if your PSA goes down less than 4, certainly less than 0.2, your survival is a lot better than if it doesn't. So uh, that was our end point of the study, which is giving hormonal therapy and in men who got below 4, giving them testosterone alternating with hormone therapy to see how long we can maintain them as, you know, not getting resistant. So you can see here this cartoon. We call this the Batman study. Um, and the Batman study was six months of hormone therapy. We kept everybody on hormone therapy. And then after six months, if you responded, you got three months of testosterone and then three months back on hormone therapy and then three months of testosterone and then back on hormone therapy. And then we looked at how everybody did. So the primary endpoint was how many men would have PSA less than four after a year and a half. We estimated based on not a lot of good information, but what we could see from the literature that about 40% of the men would be like that. We thought we'd be we'd declare victory if we had 60% of the men like that. Uh, and we were able to get a lot of men on the study really fast. So we put 33 men on in a year and we completed the trial in last May. Uh, what we found was, uh, so four men didn't hit the goal of getting less than four, so they didn't go on the therapy. 72% of the men got below four and after 18 months. So um, when they got back to hormone therapy after a year and a half, they were still sensitive. Uh, again, well tolerated. The biggest side effect was some swelling in the lower legs. A pretty significant improvement in these guys uh, in the usual things, uh, strength, energy, uh, and then sexual function. So um, we saw the PSA. Some of the men, when we when they got done with hormones, the, the androgen suppression, and we gave the testosterone, the PSAs went way up and then dropped back down again when we stopped. And some men, it actually didn't go up at all, really. So it was kind of we didn't have enough guys to figure out if that was a marker for anything. So. Uh, we're also, you know, now at this point struggling with should we do a bigger study with this approach uh, as intermittent therapy? Um, um, and, again, that would take some significant funding and some significant interest, and we're, we're still uh, debating how to do that. So that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, these are some names of our team. Uh, again, we got this great funding from the One in Six Foundation there in Akron, Ohio. Uh, unfortunately, Ms., uh, the patient... Uh, Mr. Hunziger passed away about two years ago, and then really this was given in his memory. Um, he really taught me what you know, you know one individual can do um, with the will, power, and you know, sort of the desire to kind of to get things done. So I'll stop there. Um, I thank you guys for your attention, and you know, for I know you're, a lot of you are out there are advocates for prostate cancer research and 
appreciate that. And uh, this this slide deck will be on the website. And you're welcome to if anybody wants to email me with a question. I'm not really good about answering the phone, uh, but I'm good with email. Um, and if you if you think you might be eligible for one of these trials, um, you can email me. And if you're not in Baltimore, I can maybe hook you up with the site uh, if you're eligible. Um, and then hopefully there'll be more to come uh, as we go forward. Thanks to Rick Davis of the Enser Cancer Foundation for allowing us to post this video. Access to the whole presentation, including questions and answers, is at ancan.org slash bat hyphen presentation. The questions and answers begin at about one hour, four minutes. If you want to see more videos on advanced prostate cancer in the future, click on subscribe. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, it helps. Think anyone else might like this? Share it by email, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. There are links to more resources in the description below. Comments or suggestions are welcome below. Thanks for watching.